Batman to Coast Guard. Batman to Coast Guard. The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life. It's episode 382. It is the second week of August of 2024. I'm Ethan. Welcome back, Crab fans. I'm Liam. We have so much to talk about. And as always, so many things we can't talk about on the first and wrestling... First and only... All of a sudden, I started screwing that up. I've been saying it for like two and a half years. On the first and only wrestling podcast. The first and wrestling only podcast. That also works. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. WWE is coming off uh, the biggest domestic SummerSlam of all time this past weekend. AEW is coming off a weekend where no one watched their programming. So they redid all their angles from Saturday on Wednesday this week. And uh, we're building to yet another stadium show. AEW has a stadium show. Uh, WWE has a stadium show later this month. Anyway, it's going to be great. You've got a sh- yeah, you've got a stadium show. Conan's got a stadium show. And Jimmy Kimmel's got a stadium show. There you go. Um, actually, uh, the, the Berlin show is not a stadium show. But regardless, this is just this matters. <laughs> SummerSlam. SummerSlam. Big show, a lot of, a lot of acting, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um, a lot of telegraphed turns that uh, I absolutely fine with. I largely enjoyed the show. What did you think of SummerSlam? Yeah, I thought it was pretty. It was pretty watchable. Um, I didn't think there were any particularly strong matches, but. <laughs> Um, but look, we don't we don't go to the World Wrestling Federation for pro wrestling. Uh, no, I'm I'm joking. Like I, everything was fine. I didn't really care for much of the opening match. We can get into specifics in a moment here, but yeah, as far as like the big stuff coming out of the show, again, kind of a a throwback to what they used to do every year, but kind of fell off somewhere in the mid to late 2010s, like SummerSlam historically is a big angle show right like it is a yep. let's set the tempo for the fall let's set up our feuds usually a lot of heel wins yep to set up the fall programs and that's what the show did and it did a good job in that way yep show began with Liv morgan and rhea ripley and we got the dirty dom turn i saw a meme that said uh Dom Mysterio is the first guy I ever saw who is a heel who turned more heel. <laughs> he was a heel and he somehow turned more heel. Uh, I thought that was funny. Uh, Liv, Liv and Dom are together. Rhea and Priest are now like uh, the Terror Twins or something. The Wonder mm-hmm. Twins. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're off together now uh, in maybe their own new faction. I'm not sure, but uh, we have a reconstituted Judgment Day with Liv Morgan, Dom Mysterio. Uh, people went nuts for these two making out. Um, I don't trust their intentions. What do you think? <laughs> what do I think of their intentions? Yes, uh, the fans' intentions cheering on that. Oh, I mean, there, the, there's always been a very deeply guttural reaction to anything involving Liv Morgan on... Uh... <laughs> on WWE television. Uh so yeah, I don't uh, I don't I don't trust the intentions either. Uh as far as the the angle, like we said, we've been talking about it for months now. We all kind of thought that's where it was going, I think, and that's that's fine, by the way. You can just do the thing that makes sense. You don't <laughs> you don't have to uh swerve everybody just for the sake of it. So uh Rhea has basically been a baby face for like a year and a half anyway. So now she's a real baby face uh, who has been wronged uh, in in a more specific way than just like her tag partner beat her up. So now she's a baby face. Yeah. Like she was she was deeply betrayed by uh, her her boyfriend, even though both she and her boyfriend are married to other people. (laughs) Um, She was deeply betrayed and therefore uh, is righteously angry now. And we can all get behind her as a as a baby face. So. Um, yeah, that all that all worked. And then, yeah, it, it continued on. If if one if one Judgment Day explodes angle isn't enough for you, we got two on this show, as you mentioned, with Finn also costing Priest the raw belt. And 
yeah, I don't know. That group without the two most protected members of it, I feel like good luck. But, uh, you know, in the short term, they're kind of the de facto top heels on the brand. I guess I guess Gunther's also a heel. But um, the Judgment Day stuff, if this uh, if the Raw after SummerSlam is any indication, is still going to be the primary focus of the show and is going to be relied on to carry a lot of segments across the show. Top single Finn Bar- Balor, who uh, started phoning it in five years ago. <laughs> And uh, Carlito, who is absolutely washed, and JD McDonough, who has never had it and right. will never have it. We'll see. We'll see how that works out. Braun Breaker beat Sami Zayn for the Intercontinental Championship. They got less than six minutes. I, I don't know what we what we're doing here. Why didn't Braun just beat him at the last show? Uh, one of uh, one of pro, pro wrestling's great unsolved mysteries, you know. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it the the impact felt lessened. Like I, uh, the idea of him winning it on the big stadium show, uh, it'll look. I guess it'll look better in video packages. But um, yeah, he either should have just not gotten the title match on the previous show, or he should have uh, won it on the previous show. Uh, beating him did nothing for him. Uh, but hey, we got a very funny visual of the WWE Legends uh, press box during this match, which featured uh, Kevin Nash, X Pac, the Steiner brothers, DDP, and whatever Broadbreaker's current NXT girlfriend is. Izzy uh, Dame. Izzy Dame. Thank you. The and all Ms. of the legends. And and uh, Jackie Moore, Miss Jackie. Oh, that's right. Because they sat next to Scott Steiner and what had to be a rib. Yeah. Well, I, I, my theory was, as we spoke off the air, is that they had to sit someone between DDP and uh, and Steiner in case that, that old 2001 beef heated up again. Forgotten about that. Uh, Scott Steiner was an absolute menace at the end of WCW. Like a psychopath. Oh, yeah, for sure. Just unchecked roid rage. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> um. La Knight beat Logan Paul. All right. <laughs> Logan Paul somehow got hurt in this match. Uh, LA Knight is now the mid-card champion. Probably makes for better television when the champion will be on TV every week. So there is at least that. Yeah, and it's a nice little, we talked about it last week, a nice little, you know, gold watch for <laughs> LA Knight because he's never going to be the world champion. So No, no. They decided that's not in the cards. <laughs> Nia Jax beat Bailey to win the other women's championship. Um, Bailey had boo boo face. <laughs> Can't say I blame her. If they say you told me you're going out there and you're gonna get run over by Nia Jax, <laughs> Nia was safer than uh, than usual. I'll give her that, and. Um, yeah, good for her. The uh, the queen thing with Naya and uh, Miss Money in the Bank with Tiffy. I don't know. Maybe it'll be something. Uh, you just feel for Bailey, who really no teeth in this in this title run. It was just kind of there for four months. Yeah, like they I mean, they gave her the, you know, the rumble win and they gave her a, a, a solid starting point feud with the, the judgment or not judgment day, the damage control breakup. Yeah. Um, but post her winning the belt, they moved all the damage control people to raw, which is fine, <laughs> but she immediately had zero challengers, which is why she ended up feuding with like Chelsea green and Piper Niven for two months. And, uh, and then went into a feud with Naya to lose the belt. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it is a problem that has not been eliminated since the uh, the previous guy in charge has left, which is that very often they build up to the big title win and have n- and give no thought to what the person who just won the belt is going to do after they have won. So, uh, yeah, you f- feel for um, the it, this feud was weird anyway, because the feud is all built around how. Naya is a bad wrestler <laughs> and, Unsa- and unsafe right yes. and hurt Bailey for real which right 
is fine if you're doing a you know a, a documentary or something or a reality show about a wrestling show it's against the wrestler's code right um but yeah it, it was a weird feud anyway and then bailey just lost so yeah i don't know um good good luck i mean she's <laughs> she's kind of still there you know they don't really have any other top baby faces position so i'm sure she'll be involved in rematches or if and when tiffy does uh cash in maybe she'll be a challenger there but yeah rough rough going for her over the last uh over the last several months drew mcintyre beat cm punk when cm punk's <laughs> pride got the best of him and he attacked the referee seth freaking rollins uh i thought the wrestling match was uh was really bad look i like cm punk i like phil uh, have a lot of respect for Phil, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. I do. Uh, I have respect for him and his game and uh, <laughs> I respect for him and his ability. And uh, uh, yeah, that said, the man's washed <laughs> and yeah, he's he's a little fella who worked a very tough indie style for 20, you know, for 15 years or 20 years and then took 10 years off. It's like, he's not going to get better <laughs> not doing anything for nine years. And yeah. now he's in his mid to late forties and he's got a lot of, uh, he's got a lot of mileage on him and he, he's washed and that's fine. And also he's bigger than he's ever been. Yeah. I mean, the straight edge guy, you know, doing, you know what? <laughs> Does Tarina ball count? against straight edge i don't know i don't know i don't know if it does or not but uh yeah i mean think, I... what do you think of this two of your favorite guys drew and phil <laughs> um death is referee just uh, <laughs> yeah it was no it was no good for me um like i mean there was a lot of heat for this don't get me wrong like so i i completely acknowledge that i am an, something of an outlier in my uh and again i liked a lot of the individual promos they did. I got a little sick of them doing the same angle uh, over and over again, but the promos themselves, I thought drew showed a side of himself. I had never seen on WWE television. And that he was pretty entertaining with a microphone <laughs> for the first time to me. Um, but yeah, get on this poor guy for five years. Look, <laughs> I wouldn't say it if I didn't believe it. All right. Uh, All right. But he and look, no one's denying that he's a good family man, just like Phil. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, yeah, the match was bad. It was mostly built around a friendship bracelet that Drew stole from CM Punk. Uh, and to the point that before Punk gave a GTS to the ref and cost himself the match, he also cost himself the match because he had Drew locked in the middle of the ring in the Anaconda Vice but then noticed that Drew was uh, was was wearing the bracelet. And so he let go of the hold. Instead of choking him out, winning the match, and then taking the bracelet off, he let go of the hold to try to grab hold of his, of his little bracelet. And uh, thus the match continued. And uh, eventually he was, uh, he was defeated. So um, uh, not what I would do for like a top baby face, but you know, that's... That's why I'm sitting here on a podcast and not uh, not running the World Wrestling Federation, I guess. Gunther beat Damian Priest uh, after Finn Balor turned on Priest. Well, we have world champion Gunther. We have babyface Damian Priest. I like when so when somebody turns babyface, I, I always like it better when it's an action of their own that turns them babyface rather mm -hmm. than they get turned babyface because they're heal friends were mean to them sure <laughs> so, uh but aside from that like i think i think priest is going to be uh pretty over as baby face Rhea, as you mentioned has been a baby face for almost two years and uh there you go i mean if they let him do what he did on monday and just wreck shop on everybody like he's a big imposing dude yeah. uh that tends to get over in pro wrestling historically so um, yeah, if you just let him wreck, wreck shop and be an angry, angry badass, that tends to work. Um, 
The turn itself, I will just say, was telegraphed in the most ridiculous, in just the most ridiculous way, where uh, Gunther is hit with the move. He lands basically in the center of the ring and Priest pushes him into the ropes so that Finn can put his leg on there and then turns away very dramatically so that he isn't looking at Finn while Finn puts his leg on the uh, the rope. So I thought the actual spot where the turn is executed was uh, dreadful. Uh, But the result, like we said, uh, people seemed more into Priest as a result of him wrecking shop on all these heels that they don't like. And also you're allying him with Rhea, who is mega over. So uh, in the end, he'll probably come out better for just being a badass baby face teamed up with Rhea Ripley than he will have been for being the world champion since WrestleMania. Unreal. Uh, Cody Rhodes won the bloodline bloodline rules match uh, in the main event to retain the undisputed championship with help from the returning Roman Reigns. People went nuts. Uh, I think this is going to be pretty big baby face run here. Problem is, um, yeah, the, he and Cody being on the same brand uh, long term doesn't do anybody any any favors. Um, and we'll see. Uh, we'll see where we get uh, a Roman bloodline versus a solo bloodline, uh, a Rock versus uh, Roman. We got a lot. We got a lot of ways we can go here. But Rock uh, Roman returns and uh, helps Cody retain the title. And uh, there you go. What do you think? I mean, it was a huge reaction. It was a great, uh, great little angle. I mean, he just, just hit solo with the punch and the spear and then left. And uh, so you still have uh, a lot of intrigue as to what what the makeup of this is going to be. If it's going to be for the time being Roman by himself against the new bloodline or if they immediately reunite him with, say, Jay and Jimmy. Um, I don't know how close Jimmy is to being back from whatever his injury is. Um, I think people say fairly close. Okay. So whether they go right to that now or they do, you know, they set up for like a Roman solo singles match that solo wins because of all the interference. And then the Usos run out to save Roman and you set up war games. Then, I mean, it feels like everybody thinks war games is, is that is some, Roman, Jay, Jimmy, and whoever the fourth person would be, uh, maybe Cody, uh, because I do think I do think there is Cody and Roman as the new mega powers against Dwayne and Jacob Fatu or whoever is that feels to me like that could be WrestleMania night one main event next year. But that's that's a bit more of an outlandish prediction, maybe at this point when we don't know how it's all going to shake out and whether or not Dwayne is going to wrestle Cody or, du- or Roman it's, that that's not clear. We can assume that the main event of night two is Dwayne versus someone, but uh, yeah, I mean, look, Cody's still, I mean, these houses, Roman, Roman hasn't been selling these houses the last six months. You know, Cody, Cody is very much solidified and has the receipts to prove that he's the top baby face. And Roman, I assume is still not going to be around full time so it's not necessarily they have to be in conflict with each other directly but when both are around and on the same show it's going to be a talking point i think of who is you know is is roman kind of the new brock guy who isn't around all the time but when he's around is pushed so much higher than any of the regular full-time guys that all the full-time guys come off a little bit lesser than that's going to be uh, an interesting test for for this new regime. Monday night raw was in Baltimore after I went to the show. Mm-hmm. Um, hottest crowd for a show I've been to in forever. Uh, sold WWE out. show at least sold out, uh, shoot sold out. Um, I mean, in our arena, that's only probably 10,000, 9,000, something like that, but good crowd, every seat full. Mm-hmm. And uh, people were into everything. It was a really good crowd. So there you go. That's about all I have to say about it. It's uh, been a while on. since there's been a televised WWE Baltimore show, right? Like I couldn't remember they, the last one. They there was a Raw here last July. Okay, so about only about a year, but yeah. 
So, um, yeah. And uh, coming out of that, we had the big Bronson Reed angle where he attacked uh, <laughs> Seth Rollins. Everyone seemed to enjoy that. Um, as so, an, are as they writing an, Seth off again? Is he still banged up? Is that the idea? I don't know, man. Uh, if you want a word solid explanation of this, you could listen to today's Wrestling Observer Radio, sure. where Dave Meltzer says that uh, he's banged up, but he could work, but he's hurt, <laughs> but he's fine. And um, yeah, this was an injury angle, but he could still work. He's he's just fine. And uh, also Dakota Kai getting uh, taken out before her match on the show was also an injury angle. Although she's also fine, I don't. I don't know, man. I don't know what. I don't know how you could say both. It was an injury angle, and yet the people are fine. I don't. I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, they're fine in the sense, I guess, that they they took moves, so it's not like they were not cleared at the very least. But yeah, I mean, I just assumed Seth's gone for a couple of weeks while uh, Big Bronson Reed crushes a few dudes like Tozawa level dudes and then Seth will come back and they'll have a match at the uh, Berlin show. But maybe I'm wrong. That was supposed to be a, uh, a title match when Seth was the champion on that Australia show, I think. And something happened and they didn't end up getting on the show. Sure. Seth has um, Seth wrestled once since WrestleMania. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he was put into a feud as a special guest ref here over the last month i would assume they're trying to baby his injury and his recovery from knee surgery and they're looking at the long game and they want seth rollins for five to ten more years not five to ten more matches so there you go that's all we have to say about that that's all i have to say. uh anything else you want to talk about in the uh, wwe no, I think that about covers the uh, the world the World Wrestling Federation for this week. AEW. As soon as we uh, recorded last week, we recorded on Thursday night, and then the first scoop in the Wrestling Observer newsletter in decades <laughs> came out on Friday morning, where uh, Britt Baker and MJF had an argument backstage in AEW. Did not have this on my bingo card <laughs> for twenty twenty four. Uh, Britt was com uh, allegedly complaining in the women's locker room that Osprey and MJF got nearly an hour for their match on their on that dynamite. Uh, MJF's girlfriend was in the locker room, told MJF what Britt said. Britt accused the girlfriend of being a snitch. Osprey and MJF both uh, spoke to Baker about this. MJF went far, 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 far away from the locker room and punched a wall. Just Britt was suspended. Britt is back from suspension. It'll be on TV next week. Uh, I think they're the better stories in AEW are from the locker room, not from the television shows. And uh, this is just the latest example. What do you think of this? Yeah, it's... So I was thinking back to there was a show where I think it was the November pay-per-view last year where they did an angle where like MJF wrestles on the pre-show because oh, it's because him and Cole were the tag champs and Cole was hurt. Right. And they do an angle where Max gets hurt and they take him away in an ambulance. And oh, my God, is he going to make it back for the main event? Mm. Right. And they imply that if he does not come back, that Adam Cole who has a broken leg and is on crutches is going to wrestle in his place against Jay White. And I remember Britt Baker firing off a lot of tweets that night about how stupid it was that why are they trying to prevent Max from wrestling when there is a guy with a broken leg on literal crutches in the ring right now? Yes. Um, so I feel like there's, this is not the first incident of them maybe not getting along uh maybe it's the first one that's been widely reported on uh yeah i don't know i feel like i feel like there's been there's been scuttlebutt and rumor mongers uh on the internet that have 
pointed out that maybe Max is the type of guy because he he quote unquote lives the gimmick so much that tends to rub a lot of a lot of people in that locker room or can sometimes rub people in the locker room the wrong way. Um, I can also understand if Britt Baker was wrestling her first match in two years or whatever, or a year or whatever, and she got four and a half minutes while uh, MJF and Will Ospreay got an hour on that same show. Why? Maybe that would be a little bit uh, insulting to her, but um, I don't know. I mean, like it's, it's, I'm I'm not really willing to take sides (laughs) because, you know, it's it's hard to say as far as like oh who was right and who was wrong and what they were mad about. I don't know, man. It seems like it this stuff happens at every workplace, except for the part where then MGF went off and punched a wall. That doesn't happen at every workplace, I don't think. So um yeah, it sounds it sounds it sounds quite dramatic. And uh yeah, Britt Baker wasn't at TV for a couple of weeks, but there was a that was the other this is getting into dynamite. We can talk about this in a minute, but they had her cut a pre-taped promo anyway, uh, even though she wasn't there. Um, maybe that was a travel issue. There were a lot of travel issues uh, for dynamite this week, but um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it was a fun story because it's been a little while now since we've gotten any, since we've gotten any reports of, uh, of morale or otherwise in the AEW locker room. And I'm just, it's nice to know that, like, you know, Miro's gone, Andrade's gone, Punk's gone, but the the fire inside is still there. We can still get juicy backstage AEW hot goss, uh, even from, uh, even with all those uh, fire starters gone. Can I just point out, as someone who has no dog in this fight and who doesn't particularly enjoy MJF or Britt Baker, the characters. <laughs> mm-hmm. MJF and Will Ospreay are two of the people drawing the house for Wembley. Mm-hmm. And Britt Baker is just back. And her match is not selling any tickets for All In. I'm sorry, it's just not. You could argue whether or not it could or it should. But the number two men's singles program getting an hour versus an undercard program getting less time than that. Uh, It's a misunderstanding of one's place on the card. Whether they should be in that place on the card or not, you can argue that. But of course, the number two program on the show should get more time than the number seven program on the show. (laughs) Like, like, what are you doing? This is not a fair comparison because Brit and her track record as far as like moving viewership over the years and stuff is a lot stronger than what I'm about to compare her to. Sure. But I always think of the pilot episode of Total Divas where the Bellas get really upset because their match where it was like them and them and uh, Damien Sandow and somebody versus the Funkus Funkadactyls and Brodus Clay. Yeah. Got got kicked from Mania at the last minute because the Undertaker and CM Punk went too long. Right. Yeah. And you're like, I can understand being disappointed, but like, come on, guys. <laughs> right. Right. You just you need it's it's the pecking order. And like I said, as we both I think have been very nice to Britt Baker. She's a big star. She's a really big star. Maybe she should be higher on the card for where everyone is figured in for this big stadium show where they've had a bunch of tickets on sale for almost a year (laughs) and they've been at 43,000 for seven months. (laughs) You're not moving tickets for the show. Maybe the English guy and MJF will. (laughs) So, yeah. Uh, Danielson's going to retire if he if he loses to Swerve Strickland at All In. We're still building All In stuff. There's going to be a casino ladder match on the show. What did you think of Dynamite this week? Um, I mean, you kind of touched on it that it was a lot of it was rehashing angles they did on Collision that nobody watched because it was the same night as SummerSlam. Um, I mean, it 
I thought most most of the segments did an effective job of reminding you that there is a big show in a few weeks. Uh, I don't know that any of the individual segments really enhanced. I wouldn't say that. I think the MJF and uh, uh, Kyle Fletcher and Will Ospreay post match was a was pretty effective as far as building up more of this like blood feud between MJF and and Osprey. Um, but other than that, I wouldn't say it was a show that increased interest in the pay-per-view, but it certainly plugged it. <laughs> sure. As far as new matches, we have uh, the Patriarchy with defending their AEW Trios Championships against the winner of a number one contenders match on this week's collision between the Bang Bang Gang and the House of Black. Okay, fine. And uh, there will be a Casino Gauntlet match on the show for a future world title shot. We already have Darby Allen next in line for her title shot. Mm-hmm. And uh, now we're going to have another someone in line for title shot. Well, but... you have all out like two weeks after this show. That is true. Um, and then also probably a uh, wrestle dream on the October, like <sighs> that's early October. I think, or at least it was last year. So you got a lot, of, you got a lot of shows where you're going to have the champion wrestling. So I guess it's fine, but that just screams a, let's find a way to get as many people on the show as, as we can match. So we'll yeah. see. I think everything that they've done in the Tony Storm and Mariah May angle has been the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. I think it's a super hot angle. And um, them these two fighting and uh, getting their hands on each other uh, every week, they do just enough that they don't spoil what's going to happen when the bell rings, when the, when the real mm-hmm. match starts that, that for me to praise a W you don't, you need to understand how painful this could be for me. Even if Tony's one of my favorite wrestlers of all time. Uh, yeah, I think this thing else would be great. What do you, what do you think of it? Well, does it soothe, soothe the pain a little bit that by his own admittance, by Tony Khan's own admittance, this angle is more the, the the brainchild of RJ City than it is of Antonio Khan himself. Sure, a little bit. It's nice that he's willing to listen to ideas. Sure, he's willing to take input and help. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, no, I really, really like these the angles they've done. Uh, they again you talk about teasing something. They <laughs> Mariah is now carrying the stiletto that she bloodied Tony with to the ring. Yeah. And they had Tony grab the shoe and almost start hitting Mariah with it. But then it, it gets broken up and they get pulled apart again. So, yep, they give you a little bit of physicality. And it always like right when it looks like Tony might actually get the upper hand and will get her revenge. It's uh, they're pulled apart again. And uh, so, yeah, and they did the, the a post dynamite thing on socials where they were still brawling backstage after the show. So. Um, yeah, it's it's effective, and you know, if it ain't broke, you can just do a version of that on pretty much every show until until Wembley, as far as I'm concerned. They may also be building to a mixed tag with Hangman Page and Mariah May against Jeff Jarrett and Tony Storm, which is a match I didn't know I needed to see until they shot the angle for it. That would be uh, a pretty unreal match, I think, to do maybe on that way that dynamite in wales the week before can you imagine (laughs) just i mean just imagining that combination of people is bizarre and wonderful to me but uh yeah that that would be awesome they should do that (laughs) yeah so one of your uh after AEW gave you your dream match of Mm -hmm. uh, the young bucks versus sting and darby allen and then I think your new dream match was the Dynamite main event this week, which is Brian Danielson versus Jeff Jarrett. What did, did it live up to your? Uh, am I overstating that? Was that one of your dream <laughs> matches remaining? Did it live up to your hype? What did you think of it? Yeah, no, it was. Uh, it was. It was definitely up there. Um, I mean, once they they also gave us they already given us Brian Danielson versus Sutton saying. So with that out of the way, Brian Danielson versus Double J was definitely uh, was definitely on the list. Um, it kind of it reminded me of the same thing of another of my 
my dream matches, which was Orange Cassidy versus Jeff Jarrett, in that <laughs> they went the route of let's do a 2005 TNA walk and brawl garbage match. Yeah. Which is fine and probably for the best as far as Jeff Jarrett having to have a 20 minute main event on television at age 50, whatever he is. Right. Um, but it wasn't what I wanted. <laughs> Okay. Uh, you know, I was kind of, I kind of wanted like a wrestling match, but I don't think that's really in the cards for Jeff at this stage. So with that in mind, it was fun. And, uh, you know, I was cackling at the spot where Jeff, Jeff has him in the figure four and Danielson gets out of it by just slamming his knees over and over again with a steel chair. <laughs> um, the match opening with Danielson doing his entrance and him getting guitar shot from behind. Wonderful. Um, so yeah, it was, it was fun. Uh, and then, yeah, they went right into the post-match where Swerve cut a promo on him. Uh, and, uh, seemingly that was, that was the end of Jeff Jarrett, but then they went back to the, to the hangman brawl. So (laughs) Jeff's Jeff, I think, I think that's the singles match at at Wembley. Like, (laughs) yeah, it looks that way. Jeff and hangman page definitely looks like it. And Hey, cool. (laughs) Um, yeah, I mean, we were talking, I think, based on the blood and guts thing that it, that Okada needs an opponent. They did have Claudio just like win a three way and they announced they're going face to face. I don't think they've officially said that's uh, a all in match yet. But I mean, that's that's as good of a match as any as far as just, hey, let's have let's have two good wrestlers have a good wrestling match on the show type of matches. Yeah, for sure. Am I uh not in tune with the common man or did uh was Swerve Strickland playing more of a heel this week than he has in uh many months I yeah I feel like they maybe and we'll see I guess we'll see if it was the correct decision but it feels like they decided it needed a bit more of an edge so it can't just be uh Brian Daniels and going oh gee I'd sure like to win the title um <laughs> so you need like more of an obstacle for him to overcome. So yeah, Swerve's Swerve isn't just isn't going there like it's an honor to wrestle you and you know may the best man win. Yeah, he's definitely being he's talking about like maiming him and injuring him and telling him he'll never walk again and he's gonna you know bloody him in front of his family and stuff. So it's definitely and it kind of works. They they Swerve cut two promos on Dynamite technically because he did the sit down with uh oh the voice, the Hall of Fame voice of wrestling, Jim Ross, um, which was the ghost of Jim Ross. I look, we have not been kind to Jim Ross <laughs> over the years on this show. <laughs> Deservedly so. Deservedly. <laughs> but I was sad. I got real sad watching Jim on this show. Um, oh, yeah. It was it was like, as you pointed out to me, it was like elder abuse. Yeah. It's like he's lost the voice. He's lost a ton of weight. He did not look well. He did not sound well. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so with that in mind, they had they kind of had Jr. asking him like, "Hey, you you remember all the terrible things you do? Remember when you <laughs> when you had those pliers and you broke Billy Gunn's fingers, or when you invaded home, Hank Man Page's <laughs> home, or whatever?" He didn't say it in those words, but he's like, "You've you done a lot of bad stuff over the last couple of years." <laughs> And so they kind of had sort of acknowledging that. So I guess you kind of play with a guy like that who he kind he just got turned babyface because he was the psycho. Like he got turned babyface because he went into that match with Hangman and you know shot his own chest with a staple gun and stuff. Like I, so, I guess the idea is that he's he never really turned babyface in a traditional way, even though the crowd started cheering him. So I guess you can you can play with that with him having that edge without it being like a full keel turn. And in, and in this case, it probably is for the best because again, it gives a little bit more of an edge to this as like a feud beyond, you know, let's go have a grappling contest for the heavyweight championship. So, but yes, it was definitely more overt this week uh, to answer your question in the most long way possible. No, it's fine. Did you, but do you, all I could think of was um, uh, the Shawn Michaels documentary DVD from like 20 years ago where he was explaining the Hulk Hogan feud and how Terry would be more comfortable with the traditional baby face and heel. <laughs> and all you think about it was like, uh, you know, I think Brian might be more comfortable with the traditional baby face and heel, uh, <laughs> which 
just fine. Like the idea of Brian Danielson backstage politicker is hilarious because nothing could be further from the truth. But uh, it just felt like somebody was like, you know, we need this to be more traditional. Um, it's that's fine. And sometimes you, you need to do that. And maybe this is one of those times. It just makes the show schizophrenic to me when a guy in <laughs> your baby face world champion who everybody loves and has the dancing manager is all of a sudden now like, actually, I'm a bad guy. <laughs> like, wait a minute. What? I, I don't totally disagree. The only thing I would say is I think it works in the context of Swerve for the reasons I stated, which is that he 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 became beloved because he's a weird psycho who is super violent and and hurts everybody. So yeah, I think that's fine. I think it works for him in a way that it wouldn't for a lot of other baby faces. It's like if if Will Ospreay started cutting promos like this on, you know, on Brian Danielson or whatever, I would I would definitely call it more into questions than uh, than I would with Swerve, I guess. Well, uh, I think that's about it here. Um, is there anything else that you like to talk about? Not really. G- you know, here's our weekly. Well, the G1 is going on. Uh, Zack Saber has made it into the playoffs, so maybe it's his year. Or uh, on the other end, I saw Chris Carlton uh, tweeting about the long history of Naito versus Hiroki Goto. So oh, there's always that. That's that possibility. That's so depressing. I um <laughs> by the way, I the uh the New Japan play by play guy is big timing me. What Th- this guy contacted me out of nowhere over a year ago, like when he first got the gig. Mm-hmm. And was like, Hey, just networking, man, reaching out. How you doing? <laughs> I'm like, all right, cool. I was just minding my own business. All right. So now it's like, okay, I did last talk to this guy like eight months ago, right? Mm-hmm. But then I send him a message and I'm like, hey, uh, are you calling the show in D.C.? If you're in town, I'd love to buy you a beverage of your choice. This is a guy that reached out to me. <laughs> <laughs> so this is me reaching back out and saying, right. are you going to be in the, my neck of the woods later this month? Can I buy you a soda pop or a a, a glass of beer. <laughs> Nothing. Haven't heard wow. back. Look, man, I am already not happy that I have to go to Washington, D.C. for this New Japan show. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, so uh, the New Japan play by play guy is big timing me. <laughs> Just well, we've got our episode title for this week. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Go for it. All right. Uh, yeah. So uh, enjoy um, whatever wrestling there is this weekend, everyone. There's always something. <laughs> uh, and in, until next time, I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. I'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life. Bye bye. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. He's chosen for a little nicotine hit, and he uh, he can't get one. Well, told uh, told Hyde he's just not feeling it. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Dean, what's Dean? What's the problem? Vibes are off, man. <laughs> let's just let's just uh, let's just pack it in, huh? <laughs> let's get back to the good old U.S. of A. <clears throat> uh, man. Well, we're gonna need Dean Kramer with uh, with uh, Rodriguez now on the DL. Yeah. <clears throat> starting yeah. starting pitcher Albert Suarez back on the menu unexpectedly <laughs> for like the fourth time this year. Yeah. <clears throat> the amazing thing is that uh, the Orioles have played like butt, just like absolute ass mm-hmm. for the last uh, month and a half. And yet, <laughs> tied with the New York Yankees for the best record in the American League.
Unreal. A half game behind the Phillies for the best record in baseball. <laughs> Apparently, everybody else has also gone in the crapper for the last six weeks. Yeah, I guess it's just... <laughs> I mean, but you could kind of see that with the trade deadline based on how many people were like, there were so few sellers because it's like 22 out of 30 teams are within like five right. games of that final wild card spot, if not, you know, the division. Right, right. But yeah, there's a, it makes you think that like if Kyle Bradish was healthy, if maybe if Means had stayed healthy, if, the back end of their bullpen was better. Like, would they have a hundred wins already? <laughs> um, so I think if there was one really good team, they just they'd be <clears throat> like they'd be over, <laughs> they'd be guaranteed a winning record for the season already by now. Let's see, we're at sixty-eight and forty-seven. So let's just give it. I don't know, arbitrary tip. We could be at. Maybe 80 wins. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> oh, man. No one has a winning percentage over 600 in Major League Baseball. That's so ridiculous. <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, and like, you, like ev- and every team that was like getting out in front at the start of the season had like their faltering. I mean, the Mariners bucked the trend by being terrible <laughs> starting at like the end of May. <laughs> Correct. But everybody else, like the Guardians, f- started to falter. Yankees and Orioles both faltered at the same time somehow. Yeah. The Phillies fell down a little bit. Braves fell apart. Yep. Braves are behind the Mets currently. Yes. By a half game. Unreal. Uh, yeah. Just a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of uh, homogeny. Mm-hmm. And, uh, a lot of a lot of mediocre baseball being played across the league. A lot of balance. <laughs> In the first half of the year, Dwayne Johnson earned six point seven million dollars and fifteen point seven million dollars worth of stock units in two transactions as part of his thirty million dollar agreement with TKO. <laughs> he also earned a combined seven hundred thousand dollars in royalties. And incurred three point one million dollars in "quote unquote" certain travel expenses associated with delivering service in the first six months, of which four hundred thousand dollars was paid back to him. I assume this is like private flights. Oh uh, <laughs> yeah, but uh, I don't know, man. He incurred three point one million dollars in travel expenses. What? <laughs> <laughs> 45 minutes to digest. What did he eat? Wood chips? <laughs> <laughs> Why did they only pay back 400 grand to him if he spent $3.1 million? That's got to be a weird logistical thing of like, I... it, was, it was within driving distance, but he flew. So right. they don't pay those. Can I, tell you, can I tell you what I think it is? What is that? I think it's. Somebody at TKO is playing hide the ball. <laughs> A little yin yang, yes, no. <laughs> Here today, gone tomorrow. <laughs> I try to keep on keeping on.